Dear colleagues, I'm excited to participate in the Global Leopard Conference, uh, specifically to talk to you about the IUCN Red List assessment uh, that we're undergoing currently. Uh, this is the global status update for Panther apartus across their entire range. I am a member of the IUCN Cat Specialist Group and the Director of the Clause Conservancy. Quick outline for the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss the assessment process, talk about the different criteria and categories of uh, the assessment and status according to the IUCN. Talk about the current listing and justification of leopards worldwide. Discuss the threats, challenges to our assessment, and discuss uh, a couple regions of particular interest where we are data deficient. And then just a thank you uh, for all of you who have uh, contributed in different ways to the assessments in the past, the current assessment that's happening, and then ways to help. So first, um, the objectives of the assessment are to get a, an accurate understanding of leopard status worldwide. And this is quite a tall task uh, for a species that's so wide ranging and secretive so it's been a very difficult um, uh, challenge to actually get information from the remotest corners of the globe to understand this. Uh, we want to determine the conservation status. So are they doing well? Are they doing poorly? Are populations declining in some areas and increasing in others? Uh, are the populations stable? We also want to foster international uh, cooperation. And so this is one of the great opportunities of working with the IUCN is that we speak to people from various countries all around the world to uh, work towards a common goal. Uh, we want to help implement management strategies to either maintain leopard populations as they are or to improve their status in different parts of their range, depending on uh, what tools we have and uh, what resources are available for different regions and governments and researchers, and help to uh, provide the uh, background and information to help mobilize those resources uh, for improvement. Leopards are the most difficult of all the big cats to study. Uh, they're the most widely distributed, of course, they're highly adaptable, uh, so it makes it really difficult to uh, determine exactly what type of habitat uh, a leopard will thrive in because they, they can live in such a variety of areas. And they're, they have such a secretive nature that doing surveys can be really challenging, um, even in the best of habitats. Uh, but we're reliant on experts from around the world to provide information we appreciate all the feedback and constructive criticism as we strive uh, for accuracy. Uh, we certainly do not feel that our assessments of the past are perfect. And typically, once an assessment is published, we hear from a variety of people with uh, feedback, um, criticism on uh, different ways that we can improve uh, this uh, update. So uh, we appreciate all of that feedback and it only helps us to improve our assessments in the future. So for the assessment, we use a variety of data uh, to formulate our uh, update. First, we use published data. Um, we use sightings, uh, we use surveys including uh, camera traps, uh, spore or tracking surveys, questionnaires, human wildlife conflict records, and expert input. For the 2016 assessment, we had 1,300 sources. The current assessment that we're working on has 1,750. And of those 450 additional sources, all of them are for 
uh, the African subspecies because most of the subspecies across Asia have already done their own assessments. So we're using information directly from those assessments to um, perfect and update uh, our current assessment for the global status. The key types of information that we use for the assessment are distribution, so understanding the, the full range where the species is present, especially compared to uh, the historic range, population size uh, in a particular area, so where uh, we understand and, and have uh, numbers for leopards within national parks or within certain regions, and then local density estimation. So looking at whether the densities are high, uh, low, uh, expected levels based on habitat and prey availability. So within our assessment, you, we use a variety of previous research and research done on sympatric species uh, that may be ecologically uh, informative for us. So first we compare previous and regional assessments and then do revisions. Uh, in the past, this has been a real challenge because data for leopards has been so deficient uh, across their range. But as we gain more and more information over time, uh, our assessments get better and better. Also, suitable habitat modeling uh, and human population growth. So looking at available habitats for leopards, uh, prey densities, uh, different habitat structures where leopards uh, are more likely to live, but then also looking at human population growth and how that population growth can lead to habitat fragmentation and changes in environmental conditions that can either be favorable or unfavorable uh, to leopards. Then lastly, uh, looking at better uh, studies of sympatric species. For example, in the last leopard assessment from 2016, we actually used some information looking at lion uh, distribution to inform our assessment for leopards. So when reviewing the assessment, there are several criteria that we use uh, categorized uh, in five different uh, letters. So for criteria A, we look at population size reduction. And we view this through the lens of the past, the present, and or projected for the future. So if we see habitat changes that are occurring now that we believe are going to be detrimental or optimal for the species, we can project how we believe species are going to respond. B is the geographic range size and fragmentation, whether there are few locations, decline or fluctuation within that overall geographic range. C is small and declining population size and fragmentation, fluctuations and or uh, few subpopulations. D is very small population or very restricted distribution. E, lastly, is quantitative analysis of extinction risk using population viability analysis. When viewing these criteria, we look at them through the lens of different categories. So if a species is extinct, that means there's no reasonable doubt that the last individuals have died. There's the category of extinction in the wild, uh, known to only survive in cultivation, captivity, or naturalized well outside the past range. So the species that no longer exists in the wild, but exists in captive situations or breeding uh, populations. Um, in 
captivity. Critically endangered uh, meets any of criteria A to E with extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. Endangered meets any of criteria A through E with very high risk of extinction. Vulnerable meets any criteria A to E with high risk, uh, risk of extinction. Near threatened, close to qualifying or likely to qualify in the near future for endangered. Least concern means widespread and abundant. Data deficient means that it's inadequate information for direct or indirect assessment against criteria. And non-evaluated uh, has not yet been evaluated against those criteria. When assessing a species, we not only look at the category, but there are specific subdivisions within each category. So category A, where we're looking at population size reduction, there's A1, which is population size reduction in the past, where causes are reversible, understood, and have ceased uh, in the last 10 years or the last three generations of the target species. For our example, for the leopard, generation time is about 7.42 years. So three generations would be a little over 22 years. Um, so for a critically endangered status, uh, the population would have to be reduced by 90% in that period. For endangered, it would have to have been reduced by greater than 70%, vulnerable greater than 50%. A2 is specifically looking at the past population size reduction where the causes may or may not be reversible, understood, and may or may not have ceased um, in that period. A3 is projecting into the future. A4 is looking at the past and the future, seeing that in either uh, time period uh, that there are reductions of 80% or greater for critically endangered 50% uh, for endangered, 30% for vulnerable. Now, as you look at the status of leopards now, uh, we listed them as vulnerable in 2016 using criteria A2, uh, stating that they've been reduced by greater than 30% um, over the last three generations. Now, looking at the map for the previous assessment in 20. Uh, 2007 uh, leading to 2016, we saw a reduction in extent uh, of occupancy by 61% uh, in that seven year period. Now, this is clearly uh, a problem of data deficiency, not a drastic reduction of 61% of their range in that short period of time. We got uh, a period of a lot of uh, data collection uh, in that seven year period that really helped us improve our accuracy of um, occupancy for leopards across their range. If we look at category B, um, looking specifically at geographic range, there's either B1 looking at area of occupancy or extent of occupancy. And you can see uh, the differences there where there's a, uh, reduction of uh, range uh, where the geographic range is less than 100 uh, square kilometers for critically endangered, less than 5,000 for um, endangered, 20,000 square kilometers for vulnerable. If you look at criteria C, this is small population size, critically endangered, less than 250 individuals, endangered, less than 2,500 individuals, vulnerable less than 10,000 individuals. Very smaller restricted populations, and this is looking at number of mature individuals, critically endangered less than 50, endangered less than 250, vulnerable less than 1,000. And then the quant quantitative analysis, uh, looking at the probability of extinction, greater than 50% probability of extinction in 10 years or three generations. Uh, greater than 20% in 20 years or five generations, or less than 10% uh, for vulnerable species. 
The current status for leopards is listed as vulnerable in the last red list assessment in 2016. This is based on criteria A2 uh, with a population reduction of 30% or greater over the last three generations. When we say A to C and D, that's related to direct or indirect observations that are used to assess uh, the population status. And these are projected losses uh, and potential exploitation. Currently, uh, leopards are present in 63 countries, possibly extinct in seven countries, extinct in 13 countries of their previous range, and it, we are uncertain about their status in two countries. We had 12 assessors and 90 contributors to the last assessment. Looking at the range map uh, from 2008, you can see that certain regions, uh, we had pretty good data. If you look at the Arabian Peninsula, um, uh, parts of um, South Asia, India, and uh, Southwest Asia, it seems like we have more um, detailed range. When you look at West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and even parts of uh, East Asia, it looks like sort of a blanket area for leopard range. And we knew at the time of the 2016 assessment that this was likely to change pretty significantly. Um, we really hadn't done extensive surveys in those areas before 2008. And when we collected that data and called upon our colleagues to provide more detailed information, the range map changed significantly. Here's a look at our uh, current range map um, created by Peter Gerngross. Uh, you can see the historic range in yellow. In red is the areas where uh, leopards are extant and, and living. You can see that there are pretty big changes to the map, um, primarily in India, where we saw that there were areas where leopards are present, where we didn't see them previously. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, of course, in West Africa in particular, but Central Africa, parts of East Africa, and even large patches of Southern Africa were either um, leopards no longer exist or they're possibly extant and we need more information. And then of course in East Asia where large areas of leopard range that was assumed to be intact in 2008, uh, likely th there are no longer uh, viable leopard populations. When looking at the map, and breaking down the range of leopards uh, by subspecies, we have nine different subspecies listed across their range. Now, the entire range of leopard is estimated to be about 12.5 million uh, square kilometers uh, total range-wide. We have the African leopard subspecies, Panthera partis partis. We have the Arabian leopard, Panthera partis nimmer. We have the Persian leopard, Panthera partis tuliana, Indian leopard, Panthera partis fusca, Sri Lankan leopard, Panthera partis caudia, the Indo-Chinese leopard, Panthera partis delacori, de Javan leopard, Panthera partis melis, the North China leopard, Panthera partis japonensis, and the Amur leopard, Panthera partis orientalis. When looking at these different subspecies, many of them have similar threats uh, to, their, to their survival, um, mostly to do with uh, habitat fragmentation, um, human-wildlife conflict, prey depletion. Uh, another challenge when looking at the map, of course, is trying to determine where different subspecies uh, begin and end. Uh, specifically around the uh, Indian subcontinent where we have to the western border uh, the Persian leopard and the Indian leopard which uh, partially overlap. We have the Indian leopard and the Indo-Chinese leopard to the east where 
uh, there's overlap between those subspecies. And then China has four different uh, subspecies of leopards, which can make it a challenge when trying to determine how to uh, allocate resources for uh, helping for the survival, survival of each of those facing different levels of uh, conservation concern. So quickly uh, taking a tour uh, of the different leopard subspecies, we had the uh, Panthera partis partis uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, very commonly known for uh, living in savanna systems and dragging their kills uh, into trees. The Arabian leopard uh, living in um, arid, uh, rocky uh, environments along the Arabian Peninsula. Persian leopard uh, living in uh, mountainous regions around Iran, Iraq, the Caucasus. The Indian leopard that lives in a variety of habitats um, through forested environments, uh, in tiger reserves, uh, outside of tiger reserves, even in uh, urban settings around Mumbai. Sri Lankan leopards that live uh, within reserves on the island of Sri Lanka. The Indo-Chinese leopard that lives in rainforested habitats that are very lush. The North China leopard that exists in forested habitats that are in some of the colder uh, regions of their range. The Amur leopard uh, living uh, on the Amur Peninsula uh, on the border with Russia, China, and North Korea. The Javan leopard that lives in small subpopulations all around the island of Java, uh, the most densely human populated island in the world. Now for each of these subspecies there's been a variety of uh, assessments done uh, over the years uh, to understand exactly uh, the population status. So the African leopard for example uh, hasn't undergone a specific uh, status review but it's um, it would likely adhere to uh, the status of vulnerable um, using uh, criteria C2, CD. Uh, there's no estimates available. Arabian leopard is critically endangered C2, A. Um, estimated numbers in the wild 45 to 200. Uh, Persian leopard uh, endangered between 800 and 1200. Uh, the Indian leopard uh, uh, in review um, with the listing of near threatened, which would be a down listing from vulnerable, um, no estimate available. Sri Lankan leopard listed as vulnerable. Uh, Indo-Chinese leopard is critically endangered. North China leopard critically endangered. The Amur leopard critically endangered. Um, and then the Javan leopard uh, listed as endangered, uplisted from, or downlisted from critically endangered. So many of the subspecies across their range, specifically in Asia, are struggling, uh, either listed as critically endangered or endangered, with the exception of uh, the Sri Lankan leopard and the Indian leopard. So we're constantly watching uh, and trying to understand uh, the population dynamics of these areas and range expansion or contraction so that we can incorporate this into the more broad uh, assessment. Now these numbers and these uh, reviewed statuses are always changing, so uh, please be sure to provide information uh, if you feel that any of this uh, does not represent the current status. Like this is the best available information that I could find. So if um, if you have any feedback, please, please let me know. I'm happy to uh, revise this. When reviewing the threats uh, to leopards across their range, the biggest one is habitat fragmentation. And just looking at the example of uh, forested habitat in Southeast Asia, 
uh, between 1970 and 1990, there was a pretty significant change. And of course, leopards can exist outside of forested environments and even live in uh, urban and suburban environments. But when there's such a fast uh, change to uh, habitat, uh, that can significantly impact those species that live there um, because they have to adapt uh, to that changing environment and that doesn't always happen quickly. Human leopard conflict is another um, worrying threat, uh, not only when leopards come into um, human habitation uh, where people are uh, understandably concerned about their safety, but also where leopards attack livestock and then people kill them in retaliation. This photo on the right uh, was a photo uh, sent to me by Abdullah Nagy, uh, where this leopard was killed on the border of Elba National Park in Egypt. This is the first um, documented case of a leopard in that region uh, in years. And of course, now the animal is dead. So it's, it's not clear whether there are any more leopards uh, in Egypt at all. This was the last documented one. In areas where uh, trophy hunting is allowed, uh, specifically around uh, Southern and East Africa, um, poorly regulated trophy hunting can have an impact on leopard populations. Ideally, trophy hunting would occur when uh, the population is well known, uh, hunting tags are uh, given to professional hunters that will target specific individuals that are uh, older adult males that are not contributing um, genetically to the population, uh, may not even be uh, holding a territory. And so the removal of those individuals would not impact the population as a whole and provide financial uh, benefits to the government that's regulating the species, but also the communities that are living with them to either offset the costs of uh, livestock losses or um, just to provide additional benefit to encourage people to uh, live alongside them. Unfortunately, in some cases, um, trophy hunting isn't uh, regulated uh, as well as it could be, and therefore there's the removal of um, leopards that are holding territories, even females, young individuals, that can have a significant impact on uh, population stability and growth. Traditional use of leopard skins is also a threat uh, in particular in uh, tribal ceremonies uh, where people will use the skins um, uh, in traditional ceremonies for, for dancing, showing uh, power and status uh, within the community. The biggest challenge to our assessment, of course, is data deficiency. Leopards are the most wide-ranging cat species in the world, so it's impossible to collect data in every habitat in every corner of their range. Uh, we have limited resources for doing these types of data collection, um, often because people assume that leopards are doing far worse than their larger cousins, the lions and tigers. And what we found in the last assessment, of course, is that leopards are not doing as well as previously thought. Uh, leopards are secretive and so uh, we have to resort to indirect means for a lot of our data collection, but there has been a steady increase in research for leopards and doing just a quick Google Scholar search, putting Panther Apartus uh, in the search uh, for the title of articles. I found that between 1990 and 1980 and 1989, there were 56 articles written on leopards compared to lions 68, tigers 92. From 1990 to 1999, there were 82 articles written, um, 126 for lions, 116 for tigers. 2000 to 2007, 178 
um, manuscripts written uh, on leopards. Now, these articles uh, written before that first assessment published in 2008, it's only a couple hundred articles um, written. Whereas from 2008 to 2015, uh, there were 370 uh, manuscripts published. 2016 to uh, current day, there's about 510 manuscripts published uh, on leopards. So there's been a significant increase in um, articles published on leopards, and they're actually starting to catch up. And, and in the last seven year period, there's actually been more articles written on leopards than lions, which I was surprised to see. Another big challenge um, for doing our assessment is habitat modeling. Uh, as we see, looking across the geographic range of leopards, they can live in more and varied habitats than most species. Um, uh, rainforests, savannas, uh, semi-arid, arid environments, um, they can live in suburban areas, even urban areas. So generating a habitat model that's going to uh, correctly and efficiently model exactly where leopards are existing and the extent of their range is very, very difficult. So we have to do these habitat models very specifically by subspecies looking at the general habitats where they live in that particular area where they're surviving what prey is available um, their diet is uh, extremely varied uh, they're secretive generalists many individual leopards will specialize on particular animals but um, i've seen in my own research that uh, leopards will take things um, as small as reptiles and, and small birds, all the way up to medium-sized ungulates and an even large plains game. And the picture on the left is one that I took where a leopard had actually hoisted a juvenile giraffe into a tree. So um, when you're looking at a species that can eat anything um, in size between those two, um, uh, as big as a juvenile giraffe or an eland, all the way down to you know, small mammals, birds, and reptiles, it can be really difficult to say yes, with certainty a leopard will survive here, or no, a leopard uh, is not uh, present in this particular habitat. Another challenge is the distinction in subspecies. Um, genetically, uh, we're doing a, uh, an updated analysis, but currently there's nine recognized subspecies. Uh, some of these subspecies overlap, as I mentioned before, uh, when looking at the map. Um, so it can be really, really difficult to say, all right, this subspecies exists in this area. These are the habitat parameters where uh, it exists, and these are the preferences and tolerances for that species. Um, in the two pictures here, we have the, um, the leopard um, that moves through uh, densely settled areas of Mumbai, and then also um, the Javan leopard on the right that lives on the most highly uh, densely populated, human populated island in the world. Um, so the tolerances of leopards can be much higher, but oftentimes it takes time for those animals to adapt to those environments and then start to um, start to spread and move into those suburban and urban areas after significant habitat changes. Now, as we review our assessment coming up, uh, we're hoping to submit a draft uh, for review by the end of June. So part of the reason why I wanted to do a presentation is not only to share uh, what we've done in the past, but also to enlist uh, the help of all of you uh, in perfecting and correcting the previous maps. Now, there are particular regions of interest where we need more information. And this is based on the fact that many of the subspecies across Asia uh, have undergone 
updated assessments in the last few years. So we actually have really good information on those subspecies. Uh, where we're struggling right now is areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have colleagues working diligently in West Africa that are, are sharing information, but Central Africa, particularly around the Congo, um, East Africa, around Somalia, Sudan, and South Sudan uh, are areas of, of challenge for us in collecting information. So if you have any information or you have the names of colleagues that may uh, be able to provide us with updated information, we would really appreciate it. Another region of particular interest is China. Now, China uh, is particularly fascinating because it has three extremely important subspecies, uh, the Amur leopard, North China uh, leopard, and the Indo-Chinese leopard. Um, because China is so vast and uh, the habitats are so vast and the population size is so large, it can actually be really difficult to, to get updated and accurate information. So we're working with uh, colleagues in China and we actually received some updated information. So I already know that this map uh, needs improvement. But um, seeing some of the uh, presentations from colleagues uh, from China uh, during this conference um, have given us some hope that we might be able to improve and make this map more accurate. So um, calling out to all of our colleagues that uh, work in China, please uh, help us perfect this map and um, improve our understanding of, of leopards across the range in China. Lastly, <laughs> I want to thank all of the assessors and contributors uh, who provide their expertise, their time, their data, uh, their knowledge, their networks and connections to allow us to do uh, these assessments. Uh, we couldn't do these assessments without your help and input. Um, I think we're all in agreement that we want to do the best uh, that we possibly can for leopards uh, to make sure that they receive the um, necessary, necessary management and protection uh, so that they can thrive uh, into the future. Leopards are much better understood today than they've ever been and more protected than they've ever been because of your efforts. So if you have any information or have any questions uh, about the assessment information that we have, you wanna share uh, information or share uh, contacts, please write to me. Uh, my email is listed here, andrewstein at clauseconservancy.org. Again, this is an initiative um, by the IUCN and particularly the CAT Specialist Group. Many of you are members, and we thank you so much for all of your input. Looking forward to speaking with uh, many of you um, on the research that you've done. Thank you so much.